Hello, welcome to Chapter 6 and 7 Lecture, Week 8. We are moving through Chapter 6 and Chapter 7 tonight with some lecture notes and um, some examples that I'm going to try to give you via this lecture um, on video. So thanks for your patience on this, and I did want to say that we are going to drop Chapter 8, so we're going to skip over that. It will not be part of any exam, and we will move into Chapter 9 when we return uh, after spring break. The exam has been moved, so you're not now I'm needing to worry about the exam, but this lecture will serve as lecture for this. We will hit on it quickly next week, meaning two weeks from tonight, when we reconvene after spring break. So we're going to talk about international trade and investment. And what we're going to be looking at is answering a few questions here. Specifically, why does international trade occur? That's one of the questions that we're going to look at tonight. Um, and the reason that we see international trade occurring is because that both parties end up benefiting, meaning the person exporting and the person importing or the transaction that's happening. It does spark economic activity um, through exports. And then we also just see some pressure for domestic suppliers or production to cut prices and maybe increase quality because we have to maintain competitiveness. So we want to understand that trade really is the voluntary exchange of goods and services and that international trade means that there's more than one country involved. When we look at the history of trade, we go back to um, the classical version. So tonight we're going to go through classical and then we're going to move into more country-based trade, into a modern day trade, and then some contemporary issues or um, items of trade. So I'm going to scroll down here. And um, I want to talk about mercantilism. So we used to look at trade as just the way to amass wealth. And we wanted to preserve our nation by amassing treasure. And that treasure was typically in precious metals and gold of gold and silver. Now, um, We wanted to focus on encouraging exports and discouraging imports, which meant we tried to sell everything that we made. What happens in that situation is we end up squandering our resources, and that's not good for a country. And it doesn't really mean that we're going to acquire wealth. And wealth, amassing wealth and acquiring wealth isn't really maybe what we need to be focused on. So we saw a shift with Adam Smith, who is known as the father of free trade. And he brought to us, pointed out, that mercantilism actually weakens a nation because it forces a country to produce products that it's not very good at. And so therefore, it's squandering its resources and not really working toward wealth of its citizens in its country. So his theory states that we have absolute advantage that we need to consider. So rather than producing everything, he says we should just produce what we are good at. So I have for you a table on the top which shows his theory of absolute advantage. What he's saying is that we should only make what we are really, really good at and then we should trade for everything else. So when you look at this table at the top that says absolute advantage, we see that France can make wine and clocks and Japan can make wine and clocks. But if we look at this closely, we see that France is better at... Sorry, I've got my numbers wrong here. France is better than Japan at wine. And Japan is better than France at clocks. So if we look at this table, we see that it makes sense for France to make wine and not make clocks because Japan's better. So they should trade for clocks in make wine. So they would export wine and they would import clocks. So that model sounds great in theory and logical. But what we don't take into consideration then is what about opportunity costs, which is the next state or level that we went to after we looked at absolute advantage. Does it really make sense to produce everything we're better at? So looking at the comparative advantage table, we see that France is better than Japan at making wine. And, excuse me, these numbers need to be changed. So let's look at this differently. I'm going to change these. We're going to say that France makes four and Japan makes one. 
We're going to say that now we need to consider in a comparative advantage that France makes six clocks and Japan makes five. So we're going to change the way France outputs wine and clocks. Now when we look at this, France is better at wine and clocks both. So it would make sense, according to absolute advantage, for them to produce both wine and clocks. But if we think about this differently, we want to produce what we are better at relatively, not rel just relatively, but better than at, better them than them so that we can actually make money. So when we look at this, we see that we are four times better at producing wine if we're France than Japan, but we're only about 1.25, 1.3 um, better at clocks. So what makes sense then is to still trade for wine or make wine and trade for clocks because we're not good enough at clocks to warrant using those resources for clocks. So I'll give you an example that might make a little bit more sense to you. If you're a brain surgeon, and let's say you're making roughly $50,000 an hour, I have no idea what a brain surgeon makes, but I'm assuming it's a pretty good salary. But you love to garden or take care of your flowers or your yard. It's very um, stress relieving for you, but it's also something that you're really, really good at and that you don't think anyone else can do as good of a job as you. So you do both. Well, it doesn't make sense for you to take time away from the surgery room where you're making $50,000 an hour to go out and to take care of your lawn. The opportunity cost there is that you would be missing out on if you didn't consider comparative advantage approach. So a brain surgeon would hire their lawn done because they could make so much more money physically doing the surgery than taking time out of the surgery to go do the lawn. Hope this helps and hope this makes some sense. So what we're looking at then is the opportunity cost. That's how we shifted. Now, what we ended up doing after we left comparative advantage and absolute advantage and then comparative advantage is we went into more of a modern firm-based theory. Now, firm-based theory is developed for several reasons, as it states here, because we had a growing importance of multinationals, and this happened after World War II. So a lot more countries found that they had a product that they could be looking at. So what this really did is in, included more of a technology and that type of approach to looking at what we're good at and what we should produce. So this isn't a lot different than the life cycle that you might have seen in marketing, but it is a little bit different um, than what you might have done in marketing because we look at new product, which is where we see the new product enter the market. We see the demand for the product and then we see the market come saturated or the product become a standardized piece. And so one way we look at this is we look at the country similarity theory, which is another component of looking at how we trade. So inter-industry says that we would trade things that we are relatively good at making. So for example, inter-industry would be indicated by our clocks and wine example. Trading with, um, by one individual with a good from another individual wine and clocks that are not in the same industry. Now intra-industry says that we would look for a country that creates something similar to ours that we can't necessarily produce but we have a desire to have in our country as a resource to our citizens. So an example of that of intra-industry would be two countries exchanging products within the same industry such as BMW and Toyota. The Germans would trade their BMWs with the Japanese for their Toyotas. That's the same industry, but they're and trading for cars across countries. So we have um, some new trade theories, which I would encourage you to look at. And then we look at Porter's theory of national competitive advantage. And we really need to look at Porter's theory of national competitive advantage because it combines tradition, the traditional country level with the firm level approach. What we're looking at is do we consider or the theory proposes that we need to look at the success in an industry as a function of these four characteristics. So we're looking at factor conditions, which really are labor, skill, access to land or capital. We're looking at demand, which is really um, how much do they want our product? Is there an, a market for what we're doing? Are there related and supporting industries already there? And then the firm strategy, structure, and rivalry are really how we will be competing in that space. 
So we need to consider Porter's theory of competitive advantage. Now, um, foreign portfolio and foreign direct investment have increased substantially over the last few decades, and we've already really talked about this. The last piece that I would tell you to think about is Dunning's eclectic theory, which you looked at last week hopefully, um, as we looked at the Hyundai company. And so what I really wanted you to do was look at Hyundai and think about those three questions that I posed to you. So when you're looking at Hyundai and you're thinking about the wins and loses or who gains and who doesn't gain from Hyundai leaving South Korea to some degree and setting up in Alabama, we're looking at the loss of production line or the decrease in production that might be felt by the South Korean manufacturing we might see some of that filter down into the local economy in terms of people not having as many work hours or suppliers not needing to push as many products into the supply chain. There might be a loss of trucking where the automobiles in their final state are moved toward a port from with a local shipping company or trucking company. And so those are factors that we need to consider. The U.S. government might lose a little bit because if we had tariffs on those, we don't have that revenue stream anymore. But we would gain in that we would have more jobs in our economy and possibly have another corporation that would be paying into corporate tax. So those are some of the gains and losses. Um, gains would be that we would definitely see um, an uptick in the economy in Alabama. More suppliers would start to cluster in that area we would see more activity in terms of infrastructure development because we need trucks to be able to move those cars out of there. We need rail to move them out of there as well. We would possibly see an influx in people moving there for production, which can wreak havoc on a school system if we have a large influx and not a lot of tax base to support that influx. We have schools that struggle to be able to navigate and migrate in toward, into a more diverse school district when there isn't a lot of resources there to allow that to happen. And so I gave an example in my class, my day class, about um, a production plant that was in Illinois that was a meat production plant. And so it was actually bringing in the pigs, butchering them, and then they would leave, obviously, in the form of bacon or sausage or whatever that looked like to be pushed onto the shelves. And it's not a great job that people, status seekers of westernized societies, want to go for. And so therefore, it was very attractive to a lot of immigrant immigrants. And so there was a large immigrant population that came into a rural area in Illinois, and there was approximately seven different languages being spoken in some of the K-12 school districts. That was something that the school district could not handle from an infrastructure and resource standpoint because they did not have the resource allocation or the funds available to bring in people that spoke multiple languages to help educate these young children. And so those are some of the downsides that we might not always think about when we look at this kind of trade and um, a foreign company setting up in our domestic environment. Um, so the next question then we kind of went into, does this really align with Dunning's eclectic theory? And so what we're looking at with Dunning is, as you looked at in your assignment, is does it make sense for us um, to do this ourselves and set up shop on U.S. soil? So is there advantages to us owning a manufacturing location in the U.S.? And obviously that answer that was yes. Um, we then um, look at the ownership advantage, which is we would have a unique competitive advantage. We look at can we be more profitable by setting up over here in the U.S. versus shipping it over here. And then we look at how much do we need to control that manufacturing. Should we contract it out to Ford and have them run two lines and make our car over here or put it together in terms of assembly, or does it make sense to do it ourselves? And so the answer to those questions were really yes, yes, and yes. And so what we're looking at then is moving on into chapter seven, and that concludes chapter six. But what we're gonna look at in chapter seven is really deciding what all this looks like in terms of how we understand the movement of money. So why does international trade occur? We've really gone through that. Now we're going to be looking at the next piece, which is how do we understand the trading of money and how do we ensure that international monetary system functions efficiently to promote world commerce? 
So there's two groups we're really going to look at tonight, which is going to be the International Monetary Fund, and we're going to look at the World Bank. The